Does your financial advisor take the time to really listen to you? Is your financial strategy personalized to you and your family? Will your financial advisor be there as your life and financial situation change? Hi, I'm Jerry Mangona, your Edward Jones financial advisor. I live here in Corktown, just a few blocks from the Daily Detroit studios. And when we work together, we'll focus on what's important to you. We'll use an established process to create a personalized financial strategy backed by the advice, tools, and resources to help you reach your goals. And we'll partner together to help your strategy stay on track. Contact me toll-free today at 866-975-8655. Again, that's 866-975-8655. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Hello, friends, and welcome to your Daily Detroit, sharing what to know and where to go in Southeast Michigan. It is Thursday, December 15th, 2022. We've got a big show for you today talking about a very interesting poll that covers a wide variety of questions. This is a lot more interesting to me than those that just do one or two things. We're covering a bunch of different topics. To help me do it, Eric Tritko joins me virtually. Welcome back to the show, sir. Jerry, great to be back. It's been a little bit since I've been on, and um, yeah, excited to talk about a couple topics today. Yeah, for sure. I mean, listeners will know that uh, you have experience in automotive reporting, but you also have a business background as well, so I thought it would be a good round out to kind of talk about this kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to dig into in this poll. Yeah, for sure. So let's set the table. This was done by the Detroit Regional Chamber. I should say commissioned by the Detroit Regional Chamber, and the people who did it are the Glenn Gariff Group. And uh, they're a reputable pollster in the state of Michigan. This is a a statewide poll of 600 registered Michigan voters between November 28th and December 1st, 2022. Now, I know some listeners might go, 600, that's not as many as you'd like. But uh, the reality is, is with these kind of polls, when you're doing phone samples, when you're doing cell phone samples, it's actually quite a uh, challenge to get this many respondents and get it in a way that you can kind of use it statistically accurately. You know, you see the snap polls we'll do on our newsletter or whatever, and those are just little snapshots and those are really about like our readership, but we can't really say anything outside of that of what that means because we're not kind of running it through the statistical grinder, you know? Absolutely. So let's get into the topics. And I think the biggest one and the biggest headline out of this is that inflation still continues to be the biggest thing that is concerning Michigan voters. Uh, Nearly 41% say that inflation in the economy is the most pressing issue facing Michigan. Then some other issues that are important include the cost of gas and goods, the economy and jobs. Both of those are above 20%. And then in the sub-10% area, abortion and women's rights are at 7.3%. Roads around 7%, you know, it keeps going down. Uh, there's one that's Joe Biden and the Democrats. It sounds like a, a really bad ska band <laughs> at 4.3%. <laughs> you know, it's interesting to me to see this list of people and these issues. You see these things on social media, but it doesn't reflect in the polling. And that kind of gets to me of like the funhouse media that social media can be sometimes. It really is a, as you say, a funhouse mirror room because it tends to be the three or 4%, sometimes 5% on each end, whether you're whatever your point of view is, talking really loudly and trying to, and often driving the conversation and and the agendas for those groups. And in the middle is everyone who's just like, "Um, maybe, but I don't see that. And I think that's reflected on a couple issues that you would think would be bigger numbers, but aren't reflected in this poll. Yeah. When I was attending kind of the webinar about this this morning, the pollster talked about the idea, and so did the chamber, the idea that most people right now are in the center and that there's a big push towards like bipartisanship and consensus. And that's kind of echoed in an NPR Maris poll that came out that there is like this renewed push. I don't know why it is. I feel like just two years ago was all about like stand your ground. And then now in this midterm, it's all about this like consensus move. And I'm curious to see like why that is. I know the public kind of like vacillates between that over time. I think people are, worn out and tired from being pushed on the edges or feel like they're being pushed on the edges and they just kind of like enough we just nothing's happening nothing good is happening if we work together maybe this will i don't say fix itself but maybe we'll actually will accomplish something instead of yelling at each other if we work together maybe we can figure it out one thing i thought was interesting was that food prices 
overtook gas prices as the top worry about, you know, the cost of things. So just a few weeks ago, we had all these things about gas prices. Now you can drive around Metro Detroit. You can find, I just did yesterday, gas under $3 a gallon. So food prices are now the top worry for more than 43% of Michiganders. Gas is at 22%. Uh, 21% is kind of like the cost of everything. We'll unpack a little bit of that later because there is a difference between kind of the three main political stripes of Democratic, Independent, and Republican on answers to these things. And then everything else is a lot Mm -hmm. smaller. So electricity and heating, that's like 3.4%. And then mortgages and housing and rent costs, that's only 3%. So you see a lot of coverage about you know, rent moratoriums expiring and landlords and all that other stuff. But as far as top worries, it's down way down there on the list. I think let's start with gas prices because that's because it has dropped maybe a dollar a gallon over the last, what, two months, maybe two to three months for sure. And like you, yeah, I, one of the great things about my Costco membership is, yeah, I paid last time I filled up, I think I paid two seventy three a gallon, which was which was great because for a while for my little car, it was costing 70 and 80 dollars to fill up. But that said, it really has been for me and I think for a lot of people, food that has been the issue, whether it's going to the grocery store or going out to eat. And I think now that gas prices have dropped, people are realizing exactly how much more expensive it is, whether you're, you know, as as I said, going to the grocery store and and I tend to buy two or three days at a time at uh, either Westbourne Market or Papa Joe's because they're both about equal distance for me to drive. I can't go in there without spending $30 minimum, even if I just go in to buy three things, it seems like. If you're ordering out, I mean, go to Five Guys for two people, a burger and fries and a couple drinks, and it's $30. You go out to eat at a bar, pub, whatever, you know, you're going to look at $100, let alone going out to eat at a nice restaurant. I can't imagine what that's going to be these days, probably two or 300 bucks. Well, I think you're seeing impacts in the restaurant business. So the in-season kitchen in Royal Oak is actually closing this Saturday. And the reason that they cited, and this is a vegetarian and vegan restaurant, is that it's the cost of what they're buying. So they said that cauliflower, romaine lettuce, and oil are going up between 80 and 200%. I mean, they're hoping to finish the renovations on their main spot, which was in-season cafe near downtown Royal Oak, which has been around forever in a day. But they cited that they just can't make it work. Uh, you know, at that price point with everything coming in for that concept. And so, yeah, they're closing this weekend. Yeah. And and I'm very familiar with where that location is because it's literally around the corner from my house. It's a high traffic area on Woodward just south of 14 Mile. Parking there is always an issue and I rarely see anyone in there. So I don't know if people just go by it so quickly or, or they don't know where they can park to go in. But when you shared those numbers with me earlier about the veg costs have gone up, it was extraordinary, but when I think about it, when I walk into to the market and look at what prices are, it doesn't surprise me. It's a combination of labor shortages, especially uh, with all the issues going on in, in the Ukraine and everything. Fertilizer prices are ridiculous. Of course, fertilizer is also driven off of oil prices, too, because a lot of them are based off of uh, oil stocks. It's not surprising, and it's probably going to be another year or two before we see that, I hate to, I want to call it normalized, but come down a little bit anyways. Well, and you've got another layer on this. So the Fed had something that came out. Chairman uh, Powell talked about this, that we're actually having a retirement boom ever mm. since COVID. We're way over indexing by like a couple tenths of a percentage point. Now, it, it seems like, oh, that's just a little bit. But when you have a population this big, you, the number of retirements increasing can really pull a lot of workers off the table. And so that's going to be a long-term challenge where it's not just you have the cost of these things going up, but you have the cost of labor going up Mm -hmm. because it's constrained. Like as we get more data, we're really learning. It's not that people don't want to work anymore. It's that we don't have as many people to work anymore between the retirement issues, the people that we unfortunately lost due to COVID, and then an immigration policy that is basically a mess. Like whatever side of the aisle you're on, our immigration policy is a mess and doesn't really focus on our needs. It focuses on our fears, at least in my opinion. And so that also messes with things too, because we do have a labor shortage. Yep. I do wonder though about the retirement thing, if that's going to change in the next six to 12 months, because a lot of people retired during COVID, but the market was also doing quite well during that time frame, And people are like, oh, well, I've got all this money in my you know 401k or whatever, or my IRAs. I'm good. I'm going to retire. Why bother? Now that that's come back down, 
a good 20 to 30 percent. Some people may be rethinking that in the sense of, well, I guess I don't have as much money as I thought or may not feel as comfortable and they may come back into the marketplace. I don't know. We'll see. It's interesting, too, when they talk about whether the economy is doing better or the same. Forty five percent of people said it's doing the same. Twenty one percent said they're doing better. Thirty three percent said they're doing worse. But Across the board, and this is across the board with inflation and a number of things, Republican voters consider themselves far worse off. And that doesn't track with independents and Democrats. There's this theme through this entire poll data that Republican voters look at it very differently. And I wonder how much of this effect is the issue of you don't like the other party in power, so you're not going to feel as good about it. And in the state of Michigan, especially coming up with the new legislative term, which we're going to get into It's Democrats across the board now. I think that is part of it, but I also think it's the changing demographic of the Democratic and Republican parties in that the Republicans have, I don't want to say they've reached out, but more people of lesser means, uh, more working class, blue collar type of people have moved over to the Republican point of view or at least party in the last three to six years. And I'm wondering if that's being reflected in here as well as they're not as well off maybe where the Democratic Party has attracted more well-to-do people. And so, well, they're making the money regardless of what happens. They're going to be okay. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. That's just somewhat anecdotal and somewhat looking at it from a strategic and analytical standpoint of what's happened uh, over the last few years. Well, and there has been a great realignment. I mean, I remember at the beginning of my career, like 20 years ago, And I don't want to say like the union leadership, but union members often were very lockstep with the Democratic Party. And over that time, you can't count on someone having a union card being a Democrat anymore. No, not at all. Not at all. In fact, I would call it probably 50-50 that they're not. Yeah. So let's get into a few different topics on this. One I'll skate through kind of quickly is that in general, voters have felt good about democracy. You know, we had all of these press stories over the last few years, but it turns out that uh, 60 percent of voters are optimistic about democracy now. And when you're at that level, you've got a wider variety of support. Of course, the numbers change depending on whether you are Republican or Democrat. But at the end of the day, you know, you still have a a large section of Republicans, not a majority, but a large section that are are optimistic about democracy, which kind of gets into this. I think things are more complicated than the character narrative. No, 100 percent agree. There was some noise, but not near the noise and controversy that there was for the main election. It was a far quieter election. And I think that's why you're seeing these numbers reflected in here. And again, it's did your party win? Well, of course, you're going to feel better about democracy because your party won. You can pretty much draw a line in their independence. 62% said optimistic, 22% said pessimistic. I think, you know, they're kind of, I don't want to say playing it safe, but they're like, okay, you know, whatever, we're moving on. Interesting that lean Republican and strong Republican, about the same numbers. Overall, it's, you know, three quarters people approve of the way that Michigan handled the election. So to me, that's a a big sign. And it also goes back to that kind of, I'm even hearing it in feedback, right? Like it used to be, Oh, this side. And even from listeners who I've talked to for a long time who are, you know, I know vote Democratic on a very consistent basis. There's definitely much more of an era of like consensus going on. And I I still don't know what's underneath it all. I definitely find it interesting. Let's get into what's happening with this new legislature. For the first time in almost my entire lifetime, Democrats control the state Senate and House and there are a number of priorities that they could take up on. The question is really going to be, what do people want? And also, what are the priorities of people? So obviously, since this is a chamber poll, they're going to talk about business issues and Mm -hmm. ask about business issues. And one was overturning Michigan's right to work law. That was passed during a lame duck session way back. I think Governor Snyder, I think it was Rick Snyder was governor back then, wasn't it? Yeah, I believe that's correct. Yes. 2010? Yeah, something like that. It's been a minute. The thing that's interesting is that there are a number of business groups that want to keep right to work, but then there's also a number of unions, which I was just reading an article this morning, a lot of them who backed Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who would like to overturn it. But if you look at the public, it's not an issue as much on their radar. So 50% of Michiganders are neutral or undecided on the law. And then it's close to equal on the other side. So when it comes to overturning, it's close to 29%. When it comes to oppose overturning, it's 21.5%. It's not on the radar. When you've got half of people who are neutral or undecided, it's like, 
oh, okay, like this isn't even something that they're thinking about, but it may end up happening anyway. And I think it's one of those ones where, like you say, it is very much a union issue because as soon as that was passed, union membership dropped quite a bit. From my point of view, if you want to join a union, great, you join the union. If you don't want to join a union, then you shouldn't be forced to join a union just to have a job at a particular place or in a particular industry. Personal point of view, and I think most people at the end of the day kind of go that way in that you're going to force me to join a union just to have this job and pay a big, not, not you know whatever you want to call it, to be in that union so that I can have this job. It doesn't seem for lack of a better term, that doesn't seem American, <laughs> but you know, that's, it's, it's, it's a point of view. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who push back on that and say that, sure. Hey, those protections that you're getting that extra wage, that extra vacation yeah, is, is worth it, right. is worth it. Or it's something that that union is bargaining for you, regardless yes. if you are in it, because you don't get a separate deal. You know, that's the other challenge with that. It's not like you get a separate deal in those situations, Yep. You still get the same benefits in many cases. So it is a complex one to unpack. You know, I got a lot of mail around election time about Haley Stevens kind of blowing out Andy Levin mm -hmm. in that Democratic congressional primary because they kind of got squashed together with redistricting. Yes. I had a good feeling that Haley was going to win that strongly because I kind of know where Metro Detroit's at. Like Metro Detroit is blue and Democratic right now. Like if you look even at the Oakland County Commission, that is now blue. Like you look at things that used to be that way. You, you even see indications in Macomb County, but what they're not is progressive. Correct. Right. And yes. so there is definitely a line there. And I think there's that line on the right as well. And I think you and I have had this conversation. I've certainly had this conversation with other people. Levin definitely leans into the progressive side of it. And he has some strong union connections, although I would argue he's more union leadership than rank and file union. That said, had he made the decision to run more in the Macomb County district, which really his strength was in any ways, rather than run against Haley in the primaries, he probably would be sitting in, in Washington right now or still sitting in Washington rather than back home here. Where Haley is, that's definitely very much a, we'll call it light blue area where, yes, you, you may be progressive, but professional progressive versus aggressively progressive. Does that make well, sense? Well, I mean, I would say more of like Biden-esque or a Clinton-esque. Yes. As yes. opposed to, you know, feeling the burn. <laughs> yes, exactly. 100%. One issue that surprised pollsters because they were not aiming to find this information at all. They were like looking at this and saying, OK, what are Michigander's priorities coming into the session? At the top of the list with 24 percent and with a list of priorities like this that are all over the place, you're going to rarely have priorities that are like 55, 60 percent. But 24 percent say that the first priority is passing red flag and background check laws for new gun purchases. And I thought that was interesting because although we've had issues and I mean, Oxford obviously is in the top mm -hmm. of people's minds, it is an interesting topic. And when you dig into the data, it's even stronger when it comes to it. In fact, nearly 90 percent of Michigan voters support background checks before someone can purchase a gun and almost three quarters of Michiganders support red flag laws that would allow a court to remove guns from people that deem to be a threat to themselves or others. That is a push on gun laws that's a little different than what's out there right now. And I wonder if it's addressing the current law or is it the idea that we need to maybe address some of the things for, say, unlicensed sellers? Maybe that is like private sales. Maybe that is a concern. What are your thoughts? I know we differ on this issue a bit. Yeah, and I actually have a little bit of expertise because one of my hobbies or activities is I actively shoot pistols and rifles for sport. And so what I will say is this. Background checks for new gun purchases, it already exists. If you want to buy a firearm new at a store, you have to go in and you have to fill out what's called a 4473, which is a, not an extensive, but I mean, there's a lot of questions in there and you have to give all of your information and it goes into the federal government and they run a background check on you. So federal background checks do exist for new gun purchases. Red flag laws I have a major issue with because it, you don't have to have any proof of anything for that to happen. You can literally accuse someone of having an issue, whether it's I don't like this person, but it's, I'm going to say they threatened me and that could cause a red flag or, you know, one of your neighbors is, you know, Republican and you're a Democrat or you're a Democrat or they're, you're Republican and they're what, however, whatever it is, whether it's political, there needs to be no proof for someone to come in and take that away from you. No proof at all. And then it's almost impossible to get 
that right back or your possessions back. So I have major issues with how the red flag laws are set up right now. And if you do a little investigation into that, that's fine. As for private sales, that's a much longer and deeper topic to discuss. Could you do it for private sales? Yes, but to get it to officially happen, I don't see that being possible. Well, could it be possible? Yes, but it begins a, a registry. Well, that's the idea is that I think there are a number of people who would like a comprehensive database and registry that is connected. People who are gun control advocates would say there needs to be an overall registry, whether it's statewide, federal, so everyone knows where all the guns are. I see that view. I also practically look at it and go, as somebody who's covered crime before, mm -hmm. uh, if a criminal wants a gun, they're going to get it. Exactly. hundred percent. A few of the other issues that are above 10 percent, repealing Michigan's pension retirement tax, which is something that, frankly, uh, we hadn't talked about in a long time on the show. I was not on my radar at all. Repealing Michigan's 1931 abortion law. I think that's finishing the business of that proposal three. Yes. That overwhelmingly passed. I feel like that's going to happen regardless, especially now that that proposal overwhelmingly passed. Mm -hmm. Investing more money in training Michigan workers to fill jobs. I think that's interesting because that is a gap that we really have. It goes into accelerating tech talent and you know various things we've talked about on this show before. A larger percentage than I thought go after new jobs projects like battery plants and chip makers. So I thought that was interesting because I think there's a real question about do those subsidies return? I'm surprised that those two numbers are that low and fall in priorities because one of the things that we've seen in the news is battery plants and other EV type of infrastructure not coming here and a lot of noise being made about Michigan not doing enough to get here. So I thought that would be here, make more noise. And again, as we transition from the automotive sector and trying to draw people in from Silicon Valley or wherever else to have other high-tech jobs associated with that or train people to have those type of jobs around here. That's a big conversation topic, so I'm surprised that those numbers are that low. Interesting. And at the bottom of the list, passed legislation prohibiting discrimination against LGBTQ Michiganders. And maybe it's a distortion field of our younger audience, right? Because most mm -hmm. of our audience is 45 and under. But to see that so low, I think some people are going to feel a little weird about that one especially considering all the things with Elliot Larson and employment and recent Supreme Court decisions. When it comes to employment, at the end of the day, like the uh, Supreme Court stepped in and said employers cannot fire people because they are gay. In Michigan, until then, it was completely legal. You could just be like, you're gay, you're fired. I think LGBTQ has become, at least to me, and I'm, I'm older than you are, it's become so mainstream, I don't even think about it, right? It's like, well, why would you discriminate? Maybe that's the reason it's down that low is just because people like, well, you mean you can? I didn't know you could. So why, you know, that's why that number is so low. Well, I think about two to the Roe versus Wade debate, right? Like a lot of people thought the abortion issue was settled because of the court decision. Right. When court decisions, as we were reminded, wherever you stand on the issue, court decisions can be reversed. Mm -hmm. And I think the public thinks a court decision is final forever and ever. And that's just simply not the case. Another case can come by and undo that in a number of years. And so that's why it's important to codify a lot of the things that you want to actually put it into law. But yes. I understand why politically a lot of people didn't do it because you open up a pretty big wicket and the public doesn't always get behind you, even if they agree with you, because they're like, well, the court decision, because I think there's like this misunderstanding of civics in this, you know? Mm, yeah. It goes to the education, but yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Civics, very important. One thing that ties this whole issues that are priorities, voters were asked if they were offered an attractive job in another state, how important or not the state's policies on social issues like abortion, gay rights, and legalized marijuana would be in their decision to accept that job. That question makes a lot of sense to ask for somebody commissioning a poll like the Detroit Regional Chamber. But I think it ties into some of those priorities that you see Nearly 60% said yes. To me, like that's a big number, and that number is made up in bulk of workers 40 and under and workers that are women. So two-thirds of women say that this is a big deal to them, that if a state is friendly to their views, that will make them want to go do that job. They didn't ask this question before, but I think it's interesting to see that younger workers, and I know this from our listeners and friends, that is a priority for them. Yes, Given what we just went through with Roe v. Wade being redone, it makes sense that the numbers look like that because that's really what's driving a majority of this. And before we finish this poll up, I feel like we've got to talk about the big elephant in the room. I'm not really a national politics guy all the time, but I feel like it's important in this case to talk about Governor Gretchen Whitmer 
is uh, very strong with voters. She's still tracking close to her election victory, 56-37. And with all important independent voters, which I know a lot of people say the independent voter is dead. I'm not sure that they are dead in Michigan. She's got support of two-thirds, 66% of independent voters support Gretchen Whitmer. Now, that is the reverse of President Joe Biden, where he is at 40% approval and independents are like 38% approval. So it's interesting to see two people that are often tied together in the media and in political ads and all that other stuff have a completely different outlook within the state. They really are two different individuals viewed differently. Yeah, I think with Governor Whitmer, it's she has been less visible since the peak of COVID, and that's helped her. The economy has done okay since the peak of COVID as as things have opened up a little bit. And on top of, it was a pretty strong contrast between her and Tudor Dixon for the election. So I think those three things all come together to really bring her numbers up. As for President Biden, I think that's literally where you stand is how you're going to view it no matter what happens. And I think those numbers pretty much reflect dead on with that. Now, that was a lot, but there are pages and pages to go through. We highlighted some of the things we thought interesting. I will link to the entire voter poll in the show notes, and I'd love to see what you think of specific things, uh, things maybe we should have highlighted that we didn't highlight, that kind of thing. And it's just interesting to see where we are at as, you know, there is a big change when it comes to Uh, the state legislature, and the next two years. So, Eric, let's end the show on something fun. Okay, sounds good. Did you know that Pine Knob Music Theater is the top amphitheater in the world, according to Polestar, when it comes to gross ticket sales? That's surprising. Right? That's actually very surprising. Right? Anyway, uh, they brought in nearly $37 million. You know, that's out in Auburn Hills. I'm glad it's called Pine Knob again. Yes, because to 100%. me, it was always Pine Knob. It was always Pine Knob. Yeah, 100%. That is a venue that ranked number one. Little Caesars Arena came in 10th in its category. And then the Fox Theater was 15th in the country. Now, what are your best memories from Pine Knob? I've actually only ever been to Pine Knob once, and it was a long time ago. It was in the summer of 1997 and went with a bunch of people to go see Lilith Fair there. Oh. Which was you know, great shows and a, and a great time. And yeah, it was pretty memorable. That is my one and only memory of Pine Knob, which I guess is sad considering I've lived in the area for over 30 years. So. <laughs> what is your favorite other venue? <sighs> wow. I kind of have two. I would say Orchestra Hall because I've seen a number of uh, jazz concerts there and a couple other shows there. It's a beautiful place and the acoustics are amazing. And the other one would be Masonic, just because it's big enough to draw like some good bands there, but small enough where you don't feel lost. Like if you go to LCA, how good is that concert going to sound? I don't know, because it's the acoustics there are fine, but then you also are jamming another 20,000 or 18,000 people in there. It's not my kind of scene, but at the Masonic, where there's, you know, a couple thousand at most, you know, I saw a massive attack there right before COVID. Man, that was one of the best shows I'd seen in a long time. Oh, yeah. I wanted to go to that one. That one I I think I would have enjoyed. I have a lot of Pine Knob memories, even though there are rumors that once I cross 8 Mile, I start to dissolve. (laughs) I have gone to a number of things there, and I think I was there right around the same time you were, but for the first time, I have gone to a number of Bare Naked Ladies concerts up there. And if anyone's seen me or met me, I'm pretty much that prototypical guy who looks like you should be a Bare Naked Ladies fan. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's like the most like that tracks thing about my entire life, but it's a great venue. And I've seen a number of great performances there. And I'm not surprised it does well. I'm surprised compared to the rest of the nation as far as, as that goes. Well, what's your favorite concert venue daily Detroit at gmail.com. I think we'd love to talk about it some more. All right, Eric Tritko, it's so good to talk to you. Jared, it's great to be back on the show with you again. Absolutely. As always, feedback, dailydetroit at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. Remember that you are somebody, and we'll see you around Detroit.